So DNA Star is, uh, we, we, we've got a suite of programs uh, that range from molecular biology to structural biology to genomics. And we provide an integrated solution so that if you are um, working in one area um, and have multiple needs, you know, in your, in your lab, uh, we have software that can cover all the different needs that, that you might have. Um, so if you're, if you're a new customer um, or an old customer, there may be different components that um, you can uh, focus on, and we can certainly provide you additional information in, um, on webinars in all three of these areas. Today, though, we're going to focus in genomics, and, uh, but I'll give you just a, a brief rundown of what the different pieces are here. So we have molecular biology suite. Uh, molecular biology suite, uh, we've uh, had different tools for over 30 years. Um, some of them include things like Megaline Pro, which is a multiple sequence uh, alignment program. It can do things like phylogenetic trees, and we also have uh, software for sequence editing and primary design. So all the basic tools that you would need for molecular biology are fully supported in the suite. There's actually another program in the suite that we'll mention today for Sanger, uh, Sanger data analysis, so our SeqMan Pro, which um, is a great assembler of Sanger data, um, and, and really today's webinar is kind of a, a bridge between the old classic algorithms that we had and programs with the new NGS program. So it's a, it's a nice um, um, bridge between the two so that we can utilize both NGS and Sanger together. Of course, genomics is uh, the focus here. Um, so I'm going to show some, some data that is representative of some of the major workflows that we'll have for um, assembling NGS data, and then particular needs where that NGS data might not quite be good enough, and we will do validate some of the variations that are detected, or in some cases, just validate sequences that have been either assembled or constructed. So the genomic suite is wide-ranging. Um, there's SNP analysis. We can compare multiple sets of data. Um, we have ChIP-seq and RNA-seq, so it's a whole suite of different tools. Um, we'll have multiple different webinars on specific topics and, of course, many different videos on our website. Um, our structural biology suite uh, is some of our newer software. There's a whole uh, suite of tools here as well um, that do things like uh, great visualization of 3D structures and predictions. Um, again, if you're interested in proteins um, and, and structures, um, please take a look at our website and the, the videos and demos that support these tools. So with genomics then, uh, one of the things I like to mention is our NGS workflows are wide ranging. So we have some brand new tools for de novo transcriptome um, as well as RNA-seq, uh, new streamlined workflows for transcriptomics. Uh, of course, we've had, had very good uh, gene panel and exome analysis and genome analysis. Uh, we'll talk about the accuracy here a little bit today, um, and then we'll move on to some of the uh, in software demos. Now, one thing that I, I do like to mention right away is the hardware. So the typical question that will come up is if you're interested in this software and would like to evaluate, you know, what kind of a hardware setup do you need at least to get started, you know, in the evaluation. And uh, it varies a little bit, but in general, what I like to recommend is a three um, hard disk kind of a configuration. Your main computer um, really, any of the desktops that you, that you purchase these days are more than adequate. The i7 um, cores, you know, they can be four cores with um, some virtual cores. That's a typical um, um, type of a computer. Um, 16 to 32 gigabytes of RAM is, is more than adequate, and the, and the clock speeds are fast enough to really give you great performance. And it could be a laptop. If you've got a, lap, a laptop with 16 gigs of RAM, that can perform great for you. Um, but what's really critical is what I have labeled here as a scratch disk. And to get the best performance, you want this disk that has plenty of space on it. And the space then allows the algorithm to um, process the data, both the query data and the templates, on this disk. And you want this to be dedicated because you don't want to ask your C drive to, you know, run your OS, run the assembly algorithm, and then write all the temp files all in one spot. It usually is too much for a single C drive. So if you are going to try a demo out, um, just plug in an external drive through USB 3 and you're, and you're really good to go and you can try out the software. Um, if you have higher throughput, you'll also want to think about storage as well. So I like to add this third drive and that will be a storage drive, you know, a terabyte or more and, and you're really set to go for even the largest assemblies with this kind of a setup. So. 
So another component then is the accuracy, and that's really what the focus is today, more so than speed. And, and we've focused on accuracy for really the last couple of years with, uh, and this is mostly Illumina data, and we're using validated human genome data sets where, where we know the answer across millions of, of, of variations. And so using these reference data sets, we're able to run our assembler, our SNP caller, apply filters, and figure out how close do we get to finding all the known variations in these samples. And, and, and using this publicly available data, um, we can determine we're about 99.7% accurate you know, in these uh, alignments and, and SNP calls. So we really think that we're the most accurate, at this point, caller on the market. Um, and, and, and there's many different uh, white papers on our website, so if you're interested in looking at this in more detail, um, I've got a, a couple slides here that provide some details, but there's much more on, on the website. Uh, one of the comparisons that we like to make is just against a you know, commercial competitor. So this is uh, um, Seekman Engine. This is a little bit older, it's 12.2, so we've been doing this for a couple of years, and CLC's uh, uh, genomic workbench. And so this is just a comparison on and uh, the validated human genome, which is NA12878, and this is an exomic data set. And so we provide these numbers in our software automatically. So if you have a reference set, a VCF file, and in this case a bed file for the exome, um, you can run your data through our, our program through a specialized workflow that will, that will tell you what the accuracy is. Um, and you can see with these numbers, it's the, it's the sensitivity is really the, the that's our 99.7. We're a full percentage point more accurate than our, than our best competitor. And when you dig down into the numbers a little bit, where you see the differences, it's really the false negative and false positive detection rate. And FP stands for false positive. We're much lower than our competitors. So in, in our false negative, um, which is, can be very concerning for some folks, is much, much lower. So the number of false positives and false negatives is much lower. That leads to a better sensitivity for our software and a, and a better accuracy. Um, the timings here are actually, these are outdated, so it used to be about a little over an hour for an exome, hour and a half, and I'll show you some timings here on the next slide. So this is what's critical now is even though we're at 99.7, for some folks that's still not, not good enough. If you find a variation, you know, at a location or in a gene that's of particular interest, um, you want to be sure that it's not one of these false positives you know, that you're actually detecting. So NGS data, even with a really good, accurate assembler like Seekman Engine, there's still false positives that are present. So you may need to go in and verify these positions, and that's typically done with Sanger sequence data. And to make that easier, we, we, we constructed our software now that you can add Sanger with Illumina data, assemble it together, and then look at the data together to validate uh, variations that are in the NGS data. And so we just, just streamline that for people so they don't have to have two computers running and two programs open, and you know, which is a very cumbersome workflow to try to add that Sanger data. We really tried to make that um, streamlined. Um, so some of the timings too. So these are, these are actually assemblies that, that I ran in the last couple of weeks. They're new, brand new data sets. They're all public, from most of them from the short read archive, um, a combination of Illumina and ion torrent data. And we can see, you know, smaller things like yeast genomes, assembly times a couple of minutes, um, exomes, uh, you know, under an hour. So they can be as fast as, you know, 35 or 40 minutes to, um, this is a deeper exome at 81x coverage, so it takes a little longer, so about 53 minutes. So we got really nice performance in terms of how long it takes. Uh, and then, of course, the accuracy is as is, is high as uh, we think uh, is possible right now. So um, very, very fast assembly time. And, and very high accuracy is what we're striving for. So the question can be, you know, why validate NGS data with Sanger data? And, you know, there's a number of different workflows where um, folks want to do this sort of work. And so one of them is, you know, any kind of um, uh, clinical research that you might be doing. If you're, if you're using Illumina data to find variations, um, and it's very important to know, is that an actual variation or could it be, you know, is it a false positive? Um, and that high, relatively high false positive rate with, with NGS data makes it necessary for some folks to verify that with Sanger data. And there's actually an article here, uh, this is actually, it's in press um, for this year, 
and it's from Ambry Genetics, and it's just a whole article that just says that, you know, Sanger confirmation required to achieve optimal sensitivity. So it's a good timing to have this article come out about the same time that we released some of this new functionality. But if you read the article, um, it's really, it really focuses on, yeah, there's false positives that occur in NGS, and, if, you know, you need to check them out and verify them with Sanger um, to increase the overall accuracy of your, uh, you know, of your test. Um, but there are other reasons to use Sanger data along with NGS data. Uh, for, for many years, folks have been using it for genome resequencing. You know, you sequence a genome, um, you may find areas that are difficult to sequence uh, with Illumina data, or it's difficult to either sequence it or align it, and it leaves gaps or thin spots in the coverage. Um, you might be, in some cases, you might be trying to close a genome, um, and, and then having the longer, more accurate Sanger reads can help you get through those more uh, problematic uh, areas in the genome. And so that's another case. Another one that, that has come up quite frequently is just verifying constructs. So if you're, at, if you're at a location that's making a lot of plasmid clones or you're synthesizing DNA fragments, you know, large volumes, uh, if you may be sequencing those with NGS data. And as you get find errors in the data, you may have to go back and verify that it's not an NGS error and use Sanger data to go back and verify those constructs. So there's a number of different kind of workflows where having both types of data is a big advantage. So um, even though DNA Star has had capability of Sanger and NGS, this is the first time we've really kind of combined the two into one workflow to make it more uh, convenient for people. All right, so at this point, we'll jump out of the PowerPoint and I can discard my highlights there. There we go. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, SeqMan Engine. So if you're not familiar with uh, DNA Star software, um, SeqMan Engine um, is our NGS uh, assembler, and it's it's really set up as a wizard, and, and the wizard guides us through all different types of workflows. Uh, it's designed to be as easy as, as is possible. Um, and so it queries you with some questions about what you're trying to do, and it guides you through a series of steps then to set up assemblies of all different sequencing platforms or all different types of workflows. And we constantly tweak it and change it to make it easier. We get feedback from customers. They get hung up in certain spots. We you know, try to change um, some of the wording and, and, and make it more streamlined. We've also run more of our workflows. So I had a webinar earlier this week where we streamlined our transcriptomics workflow. And so we moved more of the workflow through the engine, query the customer up front, you know, get as much information, and then allow you to go from assembly to analysis more quickly with fewer steps or no steps in between. So here we're going to just do a project where it's just a, a, a fragment of an E. coli genome, and it's just it's a nice little example that we can use to kind of show off the, the capability. And so I'm going to assemble this on my local computer, and we'll just call it a whole genome, even though it's, it's just a piece. So it could be, you know, a synthesized fragment. It could be a targeted, you know, place that you've resequenced. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you can see we've uh, under the genomic workflow, um, we've got a number of different choices, and one of them is Sanger validation. If I go back and pick, say, exome or panel, so if this was an exome or a gene panel set, um, I would also have this Sanger validation um, option. Um, the wizard also scans your computer, and it will look at your computer to see how much memory you have, and most importantly, it's your temporary file location. And for little fragments, little pieces of DNA, or even microbial genomes, it's not that important. I can, I can have, I, I could probably use my C drive for the temp files, but anytime you're aligning to a larger reference, certainly a human genome reference, you want to make sure that this temporary file location has enough space, and it's usually about a terabyte of space, and there's a link here to technical requirements that can give you more details about the kind of computer that you'll want. So now I'm going to add a reference file, and Go on my desktop here. So here's a little GBK file that I'm going to add as the reference, and some Illumina data. So typically, a workflow will be 
we start with just the NGS data. So here's an Illumina Fast Q. This isn't paired. And you can see it says uh, Sanger reads for variant validation. So now I can add my Sanger data as well. And this is a pretty good size Sanger set. Like that, and I can set up a control if there is one. These are haploids, so it's pretty straightforward. So I just pick my Illumina data, pick the Sanger data. I could also use ion torrent data as well. And I can pick my SNP caller, and this is a haploid, so I'll select haploid. There's some SNP filtering options as well. And by default, it's at low, which is kind of relative. They're all fairly stringent. Um, but as I go to the advanced options, again, when we're validating things, uh, the idea is you probably are looking for for accuracy. And so as I look into the um, advanced options, there's a number of filters that are applied um, by default. And we have some other videos and webinars where we go into detail here. But there's some filters that are applied that are called fixed. And their, their intent is to filter out the sequencing errors so that my SNP report isn't uh, filled with primarily sequencing errors. But it is something to make note of. In some workflows, you may want to bring everything through and then filter downstream. So I can remove these hard filters completely if I want. Um, I can also change some of the depth filters and probability filters and percentage filters on the editable filters. And these are undoable downstream. And so it's just something to keep in mind that as you run your assemblies that you do have some permanent filters in place and also some soft editable filters in place. And they're, again, they're located on this assembly options page under advanced assembly options. And now I can name this uh, project. And pick an output folder. Let's see. And you can see we're getting um, a number of uh, output options. We're going to get dot assemblies and dot SQD. And so this is something we have two different uh, formats that can be saved out from um, our assembler. And for large scale uh, things, anything aligned to you know human genomes for certain. Um, dot assemblies, which they aren't editable, they're BAM file based, but they have virtually an unlimited capacity. So the really big assemblies will always go to BAM. Smaller assemblies, though, we can save, and that's smaller, I mean a few million, five million, six million reads, something like that. So generally microbial genomes and smaller, um, we can create an editable format, and it's a SeqBan Pro format. So again, for Validation of human exomes, you're probably just going to want the um, you're going to want the Illumina uh, uh, dot assembly output um, for the um, constructs, the DNA constructs and verifications. You might want to go in and edit, so you might want to use the information and edit and create a consensus. Then you might want the SeqMed Pro format. So it's just a couple of different options depending again on what your workflow is. And when we click next. Um, what we see here is a script. These are instructions for the assembler. It's going to load all the ABI files, load all the, thing, uh, all the Illumina data, and assemble it. And that takes just a couple of minutes to, to crunch through that. So I'm just going to, and what will happen when it's done is there will be a button here that says just launch it in SeqMan Pro so you can go ahead and start doing analysis. Um, I'm not gonna, we're not going to wait a couple minutes for that, so I'm just going to go right into um, one of the assemblies. And so here is, um, so I'm going to show you actually uh, two different, a, a two-step process that I did. One is just the Illumina data. So here's an E. coli Illumina. So usually as a user, you don't know that you've got areas that have problems until you first assemble it. And so I'm going to open SeqMan Pro, and I'm going to take that same data set where it just had the Illumina data assembled, just to kind of show you what some of the problems are in this particular data. Okay, so here's my Illumina data. I'll make this bigger here for you. And I'm just gonna scroll through, and you can see it's pretty pretty thin, you know, is the first thing that you'd kind of notice. It's not a lot of coverage here. 
And in fact, there's some areas here, if I go to a coverage report and sort by depth, there's areas where there's no coverage at all. So there's a couple spots. Um, not too uncommon when you're doing genome resequencing. If you're doing targeted resequencing, that's probably not as common. Uh, but here we got some, uh, you know, some thin areas. There's some other problematic areas where the Illumina data just, you know, didn't sequence very well for this uh, particular fragment. Uh, we can also run a SNP report. And the SNP report is showing me some positions then that are showing variation. So I can, um, if I position this right, I can see, oh, there's some clear variance here. Um, and here's a, here's a more problematic area. You know, you can see where the reeds got these triangles, our areas, are trim points. Reeds got trimmed back. We have some kind of messy looking gapping there. Uh, and there's just areas like this where short reeds, you know, might be a structural variation that's occurring here. And short reeds just don't resolve it very well, you know, and you really need the reed length to kind of figure out what's going on in these sort of areas. Um, and so you can kind of see them here and say, well, maybe I want to go and resequence this area with Sanger data. So that's just, just a case of where we might do that. You can also mark the area too. So one workflow is to say, well, these are areas of interest. I'm going to um, mark that I looked at them. And then I can, oops. And I can save these to a VCF file as well. So depending on your project, it might be, you might only have two areas in the whole human genome you want to check. You can make a little VCF file that says, here's two spots I need to check once I add my Sanger data. So then we go through the workflow again. Um, we can't unfortunately add the Sanger data right here. We have to, we go back to Seekman Engine, we go through that workflow, add the same Illumina, put the Sanger data in and assemble it, and we'll get another project. And here I'll reload that now. So, so here's the validation then. So we add both types of data. I'll make this bigger. And you can see now that we have some color in this alignment view. And the, it, the color is actually a pseudo, kind of a pseudo consensus. And we see a twisty triangle that says Illumina. And of course there's one for the E. coli fragment that has features. And so as I move into the data, there's that problematic area. I can expand and collapse. So there's the Illumina data. Here's the Sanger data then, these ABI files that go through this area. And I can expand these one at a time and visualize the peaks. So this is what makes us so useful, that now I can go and look at peaks and I can say, well, those peaks don't have, go right through the area. Let's look at these peaks maybe. There we go. And so I can look at the peaks at areas like this. So where the Illumina data is telling me I've got these kind of uh, insertions, just kind of a random insertion here, it's pretty clear from the Sanger data that that insertion doesn't occur there. And so I can generate a consensus then based off of these aligned Illumina or these aligned Sanger reads that's more accurate. It, it, it resolves this very, very messy area with the, with the aligned Illumina data and resolves and creates a very nice consensus with uh, the Sanger data. And so it's really nice to be able to add the data and then look at the two data types together. That is really the, um, the big benefit of having these put together. So we can also go and look at some of the SNPs. So if I go back to my SNP report, I'll try to make this smaller here so we can see everything. And I can also navigate in the SNP report and see there's an area where we had Sanger was saying it was a G and it looks like my traces are also saying there's a G SNP there. So I can expand the traces. Um, I can zoom in a little bit too. Sometimes that helps. I actually look at the peaks and determine. And this is how I could use for a SNP call. I can look at my Illumina data, look at my Sanger data, and actually look at those peaks and verify that that uh, is a SNP at that location. So it's this, this great view that allows me to do that. Here's another, again, I can expand the peaks and verify that these SNPs are in fact SNPs at these locations. Here's one that was near a homopolymer, I believe. See what that looks like. 
And so the Illumina data is not as, here's a case where the Illumina data, oh, but we didn't get, I didn't get Sanger overlap here. So that there's one where I'd want to extend. This is right at the end of my Sanger data, unfortunately. But there's an area that has a couple of Gs at a homopolymer. Um, so that's how we can use it. So it's, you know, it just makes a very convenient way to, you know, have both data types, uh, visualize them in, um, you know, in one view rather than having two different SeqMans open and trying to look at the same spot in the same project. Um, so with that, uh, you know, I know this is a, a short webinar. We're running up on a half hour here. Um, I will be make myself available for any questions that have come up. Uh, and Sharon, if you have any questions that were chatted, I'd be more than happy to address them at this point. Thanks, Matt. We actually have three questions that have come in. Um, the first question is from John, and he asks, can I combine Illumina and PAC Bio data in a single assembly? Um, Illumina and PAC Bio, uh, it, it can. So, so the, the, the key to PAC Bio is how it's been error corrected. And so if you have PAC Bio data that's gone through the HGAP system where it's uh, gone through error correction, then yeah, then you'd be able to combine the two different data types. If it hasn't been corrected, uh, it's problematic simply because the PAC Bio data will have so many errors that it will be difficult to kind of co-analyze or even to co-align the data. But yeah, otherwise, it, it, it does bring up a good point. You know, looking forward, you know, we have PAC Bio as long read now. Um, nanopore data is really just around the corner, and we are uh, we have a development team working with nanopore data, and of course that's much longer data than Sanger. And as the accuracy increases, this kind of a validation will be using you know much more long read combined with Illumina you know moving forward. So yeah, it's definitely an area of focus for us. And the next question we have is, what if I only have Sanger data? Do I use Seekman Engine to assemble that? Um, you, you could, um, but we also have, you know, our Seekman Pro, um, and, and that's, you know, where I, where I said we're kind of bridging NGS and our, uh, our, molecular bio our classic molecular biology tools. Seekman Pro alone um, is great for aligning Sanger data. So, I, so for example, I can open Seekman Pro, and I'm just going to drag this folder of, of uh, 500 Sanger reads. And so I can bring them into SeqMan Pro, and it's got its own great assembler. And I know there's this vector attached here, so I'm just going to say um, there's a vector. And you can watch that I can assemble, and I'm going to use the Pro assembler. And this is just a de novo assembly of those reads. And it's done, you know, and it's an it's extremely powerful Sanger uh, uh, assembly algorithm. Um, I can also, so same kind of interface now, I can look at all the peaks um, and generate a consensus. Um, and so this de novo assembly then, Seekman Pro uses its own kind of consensus builder to um, make a really accurate consensus. The last question that we have is, how accurate is the DNA Star Sanger data assembler? So the accuracy is, um, we, we can't measure it the same way that we can with the Illumina. We, there, there just aren't the large validated data sets available for Sanger data as there are for um, Illumina. Um, but we do have um, some information here about how this consensus is generated. And in our case, we have validated E. coli genomes where we have, you know, several thousand Sanger reads, or in this case, it's a 500, um, uh, 500 read data set. And we do have a white paper uh, on our website that shows the consensus that we build. So SeekMan uses a, its, its own um, consensus builder. It looks at these peaks, um, and it's not just the majority call, and it's not a, not a Fred's core call. It actually looks at the geometry of the peak, the shape of the peak, and it uses that quality of the peak, much like the human eye might, to determine what the, the best peaks are. And it uses that peak information for generated a consensus. And we do have, um, let's see, on our website, if you go to our support section under documentation, there's a list of white papers. And the white papers have, there's a new white paper that is Sanger data analysis. And this is based off of information that we've had around for a long time, but this new white paper uh, will show how we generate that consensus and that it is, in fact, more accurate than majority methods or methods that our competitors will use to build these consensi. 
I also wanted to point out that some of the information that I showed in the slides earlier, um, comparisons to CLC, we also have white papers that compare us to GATK, which is probably the most predominant open source um, program for um, Illumina variant detection. And so we have a number of different comparisons. They use uh, public data, so you can reproduce the, the results uh, on your own computer. Uh, but certainly, if you have any questions about the Sanger data um, accuracy, this white paper goes, I won't go into all this detail, but it's, uh, you know, explains in great detail how the peak calling algorithms are used and how um, these are used in turn to generate a consensus then that's more accurate than just the majority methods that um, other consensus callers are using.